Hello and welcome back. Uh, this will be our final talk before our next break. Um, and uh, it is a slightly different setup to the other talks. Uh, this talk is being delivered by Luke Layton, who is a Libra ethical technology specialist. It is pre-recorded, but Luke himself uh, is present at this conference and available in the chat. So at the very end, we will be having a traditional Q&A but uh, as the video is playing, he will be available to answer questions in real time. Uh, without further ado, uh, let's begin. Hello, and welcome to a talk on the LibreSoft project for Europe Python 2021. So we use Python for pretty much everything in here. Um, and I just want to uh, take the opportunity to go over that. Now, there's quite a lot to cover, so um, I just apologize in advance. Um, that is going to be very much of an overview. But I just want to give you a glimpse into the different aspects of where we use um, uh, uh, where we use Python in this project. Um, so uh, the first thing is that it's a Python, I'm going over it. it's a Python simulator of the Power Instruction set, uh, which we use for experimentation. It's only about uh, 2,000 instructions a second, but we don't care. It's written in Python, and that's more important for code clarity than anything else. Um, we use uh, Numigen for the HDL. Um, uh, HDL is a hardware definition language. Um, <clears throat> now, this includes a, a simulator, its own simulator. Um, so it will do um, a gate level um, a simulation similar to uh, Verilator and um, um, uh, uh, other um, uh, simulation tools um, for HDL. And <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it we then um, compile that to uh, uh, using a program called Yosis. Um, we out outputs uh, Verilog, which is a more standard uh, um, uh, language, but we treat it in this case as a machine code target. That Verilog is then handed over to Coriolis 2. Coriolis 2 is written in uh, um, uh, uh, a mixed Python and uh, a mixed uh, uh, C++ and Python. Um, it's a VLSI tool, so it's a, a complete tool chain. So um, you specify the program uh, and the layout in a Python program, and it will then action that and create right down to the GDS2 files for you. Um, uh, and, and you can then um, uh, send those to your foundry and get a chip back. So um, oh, the other thing is uh, chips for makers um, have created uh, a, a cell library, uh, which is needed um, here. We'll, we'll go over this uh, a bit in, 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 uh, later on. Um, uh, chips for makers have created a, a cell library specifying it in Python, where it, they run a, you run the Python program to generate the cell libraries given what is called the PDK, the physical design kit, um, for the foundry. Now, in most cases, that's un under NDA. However, fortunately, there's a couple out there. One of them is Free PDK 45, which is an academic um, PDK um, for uh, training, training students. And there is a, a recently Skywater have released their 130 nanometer PDK. PDK. Uh, normally, you would do this under uh, NDA because uh, I think so. Staff himself has to run. Uh, uh, he, has, uh, he has specified, for example, the TSMC uh, 180 nanometer uh, PDK. He's got access to that. So under that NDA, he generates the cell library to, t um, he runs the program, uh, which generates a cell library, to which is uh, suitable for uh, TSMC 180 nanometer. Um, he can't tell us what, what that is, um, but at, at, the, at the high level, we can run a parallel path um, uh, 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 along, the, along the way um, using the free PDK45. So we can track uh, what we're doing. That's what we did for the uh, 180 nanometer ASIC with, uh, um, when working with uh, Sorbonne uh, Li Lib6. Now, so, um, I'd like to, to, to explore uh, Nimitian. Um, it's uh, quite an absolutely fantastic um, HDL, um, uh, uh, very well documented. Um, uh, uh, um, and there's, there's tutorials online, uh, things where you can see uh, a thing now, just uh, briefly here. Here's your uh, module. Um, it has two signals. Um, uh, uh, it has here, there's a count. So on each clock sync is a synchronous 
uh, clock. So on the next clock cycle, um, uh, cell, uh, count will be equal to count plus one. Um, and if it over, if there's a here there's an overflow detection, so if it hits a limit, um, uh, it will set. Uh, that's combinatorial, so there's no uh, time limit on that. Um, it's always uh, enabled, uh, always generating a, a signal. Um, and if in here, if that uh, overflow is detected, then on the next clock cycle, the uh, um, uh, the uh, count is set to zero. Else it's count plus equals one. So here you can see it's just a, a counter. Now what's really nice is that we have standard Python classes and modules um, with um, the, uh, the expected behavior of documentation, which of course Sphinx understands and uh, creates what you need. So it's absolutely um, uh, you know, um, fantastic um, uh, uh, you know, as, as far as you know, readability is concerned and expectations. Um, Verilog, you know, no uh, Verilog hardware engineers are not software engineering trained, um, and it really shows. So, here's um, the repositories that we've got. Um, I think it's it is a proper Libra project. So we have uh, this. Um, we have mailing lists and uh, uh, you know, mailing us our archives, and um, we also have uh, you know an IRC channel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So development is done in real time. It's not done according to the I'll do it when you know, I'll release it when it's ready. Think we are a Libra project. So, um, uh, just to say, if you'd ever like to help, there's a have a set of procedure we can go through. Um, uh, uh, it's documented on the website. Um, uh, uh, here's how to get uh, started, and um, this is much easier to, uh, um, just by using what we call the dev end setup scripts. Um, so you can just run those in an, uh, an automated fashion. Um, uh, for example, here there's that cloning of those repositories. Um, uh, then running, the, hey, look, uh, Python set up what I develop. Uh, that's to make sure it's in place so you can actually um, um, edit uh, the code. We don't do Python setup and install um, because you'd be, you, you need to be able to edit the code in place. Um, uh, things and off you go. And uh, likewise, one install uh, uh, the uh, dependencies. Uh, I think another script there, so it's all uh, it's all uh, documented. And needs to get set up. Uh, one for CocoaDB, uh, one for Igress Verilog, etc., etc. So we picked Open Power um, because it's a supercomputing instruction set um, with a 25 years um, history. So um, the end user license agreement is um, uh, 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 was okay, absolutely, absolutely fine. I had a very nice chat with uh, Mendy from uh, the Open Power Foundation about, about it, and it's re very, very reassuring. Um, the Open Power Foundation, um, the most things have been absolutely fantastic about this um, project. It's really quite exciting. So um, what we what we did is, you know, as software engineers, um, you don't you don't do stuff by hand if it can be done automatically. So um, uh, what we decided to do was to extract information from the uh, 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 Open Power specification and uh, to write machine, put it into a machine readable format, and then um, first uh, you know, write a decoder and a parser, and including this a simulator. <laughs> All right. So. Um, the first thing we had to do was to decode uh, the major uh, major opcodes and the minor opcodes into um, uh, into into tables, and these are um, like um, microcode ops. All right. Now these originally, so you can see that you know, um, major opcode 34 is a load store operation, and it's the oper instruction LBZ, you know, own power. All right now. Interesting. All of these actually came from MicroWatt, the MicroWatt source code, which has been a fantastic reference implementation that we used. Uh, it's in VHDL, uh, but um, both Anton Blanchard and the, and the rest of the team um, are uh, software engineer trained, so they put code comments in and did continuous integration unit tests and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we extracted these uh, tables and put them into machine-readable CSV files. Okay. And then put them behind a, um, a, 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 a wiki. Connecting. Give it, give it a moment. 
um, whilst well, that's loading, I'll do this one as well. So what we also did was we extracted the pseudocode from the um, from the specification now um, and split it down into separate pages. So for example, um, oh, I know what's going on. My internet connection's gone. That's uh, that's annoying. But um, I have to wait for that to come back. Um, let's go and have a look at the source code here instead. So percent two. Um, so uh, here is the markdown files, which um, uh, this is for the store B instruction, for example. Now that D form there uh, indicates that it is uh, uh, to be uh, indicates the layout of the fields. So here's your specification. Ah, store word D form. All right. So there's your pseudocode, uh, 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 which is in the specification. Now the specification actually says this is we're not supposed to uh, make this. Um, uh, this is not supposed to be executable. We went nah, nah, forget that. I was saying we're making it executable. So um, uh, uh, because you know it's 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 correct. Um, you know we know it's going to be correct. So that's still be STW. There's STW for us. There's D form. Now the D form says that um, the layout is as follows. Okay. Um, uh, in bits 0 to 5, uh, there will be the number 36, which is the store W, um, and then um, uh, uh, RS is in bits in field uh, bits uh, 6 to 10, RA is in 11 to 15, etc. Um, now, that table, the one I was saying, um, percent 1, uh, find D form. Mm. D form, capital letters. There we go. Right, here's one of the def the deforms. So, um, the, which one was it? D there. Right, D. Yes, this one. Okay, all right. And this is an, uh, a machine. We deliberately made it machine readable. The uh, rest of the specification has, um, let's see, the failed um, find RT field RT here. So again, this is this is in the specification number. This is machine read readable, all right? Um, uh, uh, in a Python program, to a thing, and you can see that that was the D format there, all right? So so the next. Um, Go. So the next bit in the puzzle um, was to actually um, uh, convert this pseudocode into executable Python, right? And for that, I decided I absolutely love Python Ply, all right? Um, so I recovered the Garden Snake example, uh, which is a, um, a subset of Python, and I fixed several of its errors. Um, it it um, it, uh, uh, Ply is uh, an LALR uh, parser um, based on um, uh, Yak and Flex, uh, Yak, Flex, uh, um, Bison. Um, uh, but um, Python, the, the actual language itself, Python, um, doesn't lex properly in a single pass. Um, it turns out that you actually have to um, uh, 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 do some uh, um, uh, 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 some fixing fixing of some of the indentation. So I did a, um, a, 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 a in, in the in the Lexa, I look for the tokens and um, add an extra indent um, a, a, a token um, when when the opportunity is detected and uh, d I did did it, uh, d in, indent um, uh, and, and track it and that way um, are able to turn it into something that can be uh, properly parsed by um, uh, um, uh, an LAR, LAR parser. Now, um, there was also a few other things that needed uh, dealing uh, dealing with um, uh, uh, silent keyword fall through in uh, things. It also skips some blank text blank lines, um, uh, and also um, the syntax here. It, it, it turns out to be uh, this syntax turns out to be Python like. It's not exactly Python, um, uh, but it's close enough that it was able to adapt the Garden Snake thing. So I changed the tokens. Um, uh, rather than colon if some if test colon I used if test then um, and inserted the uh, the token so that's what this uh, program does is it 
oh there we go if token type equals then then replace it with a colon and if it's an else then we want to yield the else keyword and also add in a colon because that makes it a uh, um, uh, 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 Python syntax mm -hmm. so um, same with um, same with do etc etc right then um, uh, 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 so the next thing was we actually have to have a page reader which reads the syntax of the things and extracts that pseudocode and these forms this is actually a very important uh, um, part of the part of what we're doing um, uh, followed by finally an actual parser which uh, uh, if you're familiar with Python ply um, you have the uh, uh, BNF back as now format uh, syntax uh, uh, in the comment field. It's a fantastic idea. The latest version of Ply actually has it as a decorator, which is kind of nicer because then you can then use the uh, comment field for actual comments. Um, and um, in this way, we end up with some code. Um, the, uh, uh, the ID coder, ISA, uh, fixed store.py, and, um, and what was STW. And ta da, we end up with. Um, an operation. Um, this is uh, this is what the compiler outputs. All right. So uh, memory sign, a memory sign there. Uh, you know, assigns to memory at that address and there. So the um, you know uh, that's get get uh, register all zero. Uh, for, lots of little hacks like this, but it calculates the effective address um, plus uh, extent sign extends on, on the uh, immediate. Um, notice here that um, uh, the uh, D the immediate is not actually in here. What we've done is we've done a decorator which injects local variables into the into the context by actually altering the globals and the locals um, of the uh, of the function. Um, yeah, I know. Um, and then on exit, it will extract anything that's been modified. So in, in this case, that same uh, function uh, will extract RA from the um, uh, uh, from the namespace or any other variables that have been uh, modified. Um, <clears throat> so um, that's uh, uh, that's how that operates. And um, uh, it, it, it's um, uh, so we, we, we can write our own and simulate analysis. Let's have a look at one of the. Um, uh, um, <laughs> Better, yes, okay. Um, so uh, let's have a look at this one now. So here we're actually running the simulator, um, uh, uh, did you, yeah, the Python simulator. So that, those uh, instructions got decoded um, uh, um, in, in Python um, by being machine reading uh, the those formats. So um, where we have this uh, fields format here. Um, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, a second. So, where we have this format here, we match that against um, uh, the relevant um, uh, instructions format here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, then uh, we can pass in some initial memory values that we want to do and then um, run that simulated instruction. And um, assert and, co and compare it against the expected value afterwards, and we do thousands of these tests now. To double check this, we weren't confident that um, we got it right. So what we did um, was went well. You know, there's an implementation of. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, power instruction set uh, simulator. It's called QEMU. Why don't we use the machine G GDBMI uh, GDB machine interface to actually connect to QEMU? And <laughs> here's your arguments for the you know, one running little engine or big engine. Um, no graphics uh, thing. And start it up and then upload the program, the exact same compiled program to QEMU and then upload memory. All right, so do the exact same thing and upload some initial memory uh, values and run the program and then check the registers afterwards. And in that way, what we can do is we can do co simulation side by side of QEMU with our simulator. All from Python. All right. 
And then this, the, we do the exact same thing with the HDL. So we do, we're doing this bootstrap process, which we develop a very slow uh, simulator in Python because it's easier to read um, uh, and read and understand. Then cross-reference and check it against QEMU by by um, co-simulating the, um, the, the R simulator versus QEMU. Once we find that that's correct and it can run, we have confidence in R simulator, we go back and run the HDL, the, the Nemegen simulations, against the um, uh, um, uh, uh, Nemegen simulations against uh, uh, the Python-based simulator. All right. Um, and run, you know, thousands, thousands, I mean, it's literally thousands of unit tests just to make absolutely sure that we're, we're confident in what it's doing. Now, um, let's have a look at the uh, add instruction here. Fixed point, fixed point load and store, fixed point move and assist, fixed point arithmetic instructions. Okay, add it, right, brilliant. Okay, so um, here's the uh, uh, the add instruction here, which add immediate. All right. Um, let's do the. Uh, no, not that one. Uh, ah, brilliant. Add RT equal RA plus RB. All right. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, we divide it down into separate pipelines. Um, uh, uh, I think so. Um, let me show you those. Uh, push T minus. One uh, function units. So there's an ALU pipeline branch um, condition registered div, div, div unit, um, and these are divided down by um, by the profile registers. So anything that had a, needed a similar number of read and write registers, um, we, we put it in the same uh, same uh, pipeline. So uh, this is Namibian elaborate. Um, I think bear in mind here's your uh, here's that operation comp. Let's have a look. Um, uh, here's a switch that your switch statement. Now it's switching on the instruction type. That instruction type comes from the let's let's actually search for op add. Oh look, there we go. Op add. Um, there we go. There's all the op add operations here. All right, so um, it says uh, you want to read RA and RB operate operations. Notice you remember from the specification it said it needs RA and RB. All right, so this, um, so mm, no, it's back. Run it. So op stop underscore add. Here's our version. That's op, op immediate. Um, so this is the uh, this is the CSV files which are read by Python. So that's add IC add in, integer with carry. Um, instruction is that one. Dump, dump. Mine out code 31. That's the equivalent of the thing. So here's the code comment add instruction. All right. So adds uh, R8, RB, and the de destination is uh, RT. And oh, look, it has, it can do condition registers and output. So um, switch statement, you know, it, it, it's written in Python. It's got comments. Duh. Um, so here's your add. Um, so what we're doing here is we're actually doing a 65-bit add, <laughs> um, which allows us to do the carry, and then um, uh, uh, the carry overflow is a 32-bit, um, uh, uh, a 64-bit carry. So that uh, colon minus one that takes the 65th bit, and um, uh, here's a calculation for the 32-bit carry overflow, um, which came from microwatt. So um, uh, sign extent um, uh, just calls a, a function, and uh, again the switch statement is if the data length is one thing. So this is for ext b, ext half, and ext w. Um, uh, the different different instructions available, um, and um, uh, and then we, we, we end up uh, 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 joining all those together, those pipelines, etc., etc. I think I'm going to have to move on quite quickly because we're starting to. Uh, um, uh, I've got there's quite a lot else to cover. So now, um, uh, once once that's all done, we can then output it as Verilog. Um, jobs fly um, simple 
issue a fair log. Um, so uh, again, we, we can generate a core here with different options because those options are passed in um, to the um, uh, to the uh, program, which uh, uh, in, in a config file it will uh, in a configuration um, uh, object it will um, uh, uh, Python. The whole reason why we're using Python is because we can enable at compile time, this is a, comp a compiling into Verilog. Um, uh, we can, uh, oh, there we go, there's your options, the, uh, uh, the specification. We can pass this in and then do if reg width equals equals this, or if um, uh, uh, we want the uh, Zix controller, uh, interrupt controller to be generated, then output certain stuff into the, into the Verilog. Um, uh, uh, thing. Um, so um, for the uh, LibreSoft 180 core, um, which went to ASIC, uh, we needed a way to add four SRAMs, four K, four, four K SRAMs. But running the, um, uh, and the simulations, we didn't want that, so we made it an option here. Right. So uh, there's the uh, Namijan Verilog convert. Now, once that's converted, um, we can then run it. Uh, run a simulation. Okay. And this is compiling that up. And off it goes. And um, now, one of the other things that you need um, uh, when developing an ASIC is you need a, um, a, a JTAG interface. So if you don't think, you know, oh, uh, 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 um, uh, you know, when, when you, you know, just take you just take it for granted if you've ever done embedded uh, computing development, um, you just take it for granted that there's going to be a JTAG, a JTAG interface. Well, somebody has to implement that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, and uh, very kindly, um, Staff Verhagen from Chips for Makers uh, made a some uh, Namijan HDL, um, which uh, uh, implements a fully functioning JTAG tap interface. And uh, we've been think so we can set the manufacturer ID, um, and um, then uh, when you put that either into FPGA um, or uh, ASIC, or in this case in a simulation which I'll show you, show you in a, a minute, um, uh, you can get that um, manufacturer ID back. But one of the other things, um, uh, um, uh, wishbone, um, one of the things we needed was the ability to um, uh, upload programs over, over JTAG. So um, it, because we're using a wishbone interface um, uh, as the bus, um, staff added the ability to connect to the wishbone interface um, uh, over JTAG. And um, through this, we're able to actually upload programs even to the simulator. Now, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Open OCD. It's basically um, a way to manage uh, um, uh, manage um, hardware. But in this case, what we're doing is we're managing the simulation. The simulation. So it, it, we've got a JTAG interface operating here, um, and a remote bit banging interface uh, is connected up. So whilst that is running the BIOS. We've connected over OpenOCD um, and sent uh, 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 some commands to it. TDI um, uh, transmitted the data and, and, and TDO. Um, it has uh, connected and found, oh, look, there's a manufacturing ID. Well, hey, there's that um, uh, ID, uh, not, not one eight ff um, which was um, uh, a certain part number 0001. So that's um, from, from here. Where is it? Dun, 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 dun. Part number 001, and if you convert that, you'll find that that was um, uh, not x 818 ffff So from here, we can we can write some scripts, and um, uh, uh, let me see if I can find them. Um, ls debug. Yeah, yeah. Vi debug. SAS firmware upload. Um, uh, this is the <laughs> this is a command which if I run this it will actually upload a program using the same uh, test stuff that uh, we did earlier so a very simple loop program um, uh, using the same uh, compiler and etc etc to generate um, instructions um, we can pass those uh, compiled programs into um, uh, 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 over the JTAD interface to the to the uh, system that we're connecting to, uploading it in over Wishbone um, and remotely controlling it. Now, um, what's really nice about this is that the exact same 
program, uh, the JTAG uh, command system, can be used on the simulator and the FPGA and the emulator once we extract from the uh, the um, the simulator from the from the uh, VLSI tools and re-simulate the, uh, the 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 the, um, the HDL after it's been laid out. And when we come to it, we'll have a series of programs that when we get the chip back, we can actually test the things. And it's exactly the same code each and every time. Okay. Um, so um, uh, we're, we're checking again and again and again and again at every single level that the um, that what we're doing actually works. Now, um, let me leave that one. Now, so um, here was the uh, simulator, which was the Verilog code, um, which was uh, you know, after it was uh, uh, let's leave a sock, um, leave a sock dot v. So here was the machine code looking um, uh, Verilog um, after that's been uh, uh, on the median outputs this uh, from its HDL will, go, will create this uh, um, um, uh, very grungy looking Verilog for you. We don't we don't actually want to be reading that um, uh, 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 um, uh, that uh, uh, code. Um, uh, but what we do want to do is we want to hand it over to Coriolis 2. Now Coriolis 2 is the um, uh, HDL. Uh, automatic uh, layout tool and um, let's have a quick look here at um, an example um, uh, uh, program now this is a very very simple ALU which is very useful um, for um, what we're doing so let me just quickly explain it um, the top layer module has an op uh, which is a signal field um, uh, and it has two input signals a and b and it has an output of bit width width, um, uh, width. so these are um, uh, HDL signals of width width and when we declare the class we want to go oh we're declaring it as a width 16 fantastic all right so now there's an adder module and a subtractor module here let's have a quick look at those so the adder module has an a and a b as, as input and it has o as an output and oh look in combinatorial logic form it adds a to b and that's your output go figure all right and the subtract one oh look that does um, a subtract of a from b oh all right so what we then do is, depending on whether op is true or false, on the next clock cycle, the output will be set either to the results of the subtract or to the results of the add. Um, now, uh, uh, I want to say thing, this, what I've found is that it is incredibly important to uh, view these things um, uh, 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 graphically. As I, remember, I didn't do um, uh, I didn't do gate level design or, or, or hardware things. I learned this on the fly. All right, so here's your input A and B, um, which is part A and B are passed to the add and subtractor modules. Um, uh, the outputs come from here, and then there's, um, depending on the op here, it will do, um, uh, it will turn to, um, produce that output. Now, um, uh, if we do proc opt synth, now I don't normally do this, um, but I did want to um, uh, sh uh, show it to you because it's, um, uh, it, it shows you down, right down to the gate level. Now, what this has done is it has um, taken that um, uh, the cell library and um, gone down to, um, uh, to, to individual cells. So it's split out the bits of A and B, um, uh, received add, uh, the output, and um, where is... Op, yes, op goes into each individual mux here and selects one in each of the bits of A and B. And you don't normally see this kind of thing when you're dealing with high level stuff. Um, and then it goes into a flip flop to capture that output from the mux so that it's stable for the, so it will be available for the next clock cycle. And then each output, bit zero of each one, gets put together and it goes into O, uh, the output here. Okay? All right. Now, um, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. All right, is this is what the, the the actual chip looks like when it's done the layout? Okay, whoops, I always get that wrong. <laughs> and here's your indiv individual transistors um, within the cells. Okay, now um, in this particular program, what I did was I'm um, and this is a beautiful thing about uh, uh, um, about uh, Coriolis 2. I did a, a manual place 
of the adder on the left side and add a manual place of the subtractor on the right. And then I did a manual place on the individual components um, uh, uh, of the uh, of these um, uh, uh, of the cells in the um, in the muxes, and then um, and, and from there I asked it to do the routing. Uh, uh, asked Coriolis to to, to 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 handle the routing, but all of this layout here was done. Um, uh, uh, I specified these locations uh, locations of where I wanted this stuff to be in Python. Um, and I, I, I you know, specified uh, in a Python program where I wanted the uh, add to be, uh, add block to be, and the well, subtract block to be. Now, um, you can't do this kind of thing without having some kind of verification. So um, uh, what we uh, did was a part of um, uh, a part of Coriolis uh, to what it does is it extracts once it's done this layout here. It re-extracts the netlist for you into a subset of VHDL. So what we then did was passed that uh, VHDL over to um, a CocoTB simulation. Which I've just got to find. Right, CocoTB. CocoTB is again similar to what we're doing inside the um, uh, inside the uh, 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 testing. Except what it does is it takes where, where um, Numidian has its own simulator, and you can run a side-by-side -side simulation of HDL versus some Python code. CocoTB does the same thing, the exact same thing for Verilog and VHDL, and so consequently, when we have this uh, VHDL here. We can put it back into Coco TV and simulate it, and oh look, we can run the exact same JTAG tests that we did earlier, including uploading over Wishbone, sending Wishbone commands. Um, this is, uh, I apologise, it's quite um, uh, 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 hard to under understand, but um, here's the. Um, command for read and write um, because that saves um, uh, a thing. So we're writing the data uh, wishbone address here. We want to write to um, data address uh, 0001 um, and then we want to write to memory and the read back again. So we write the binary data here um, and then read back and then do an assert to make sure that the result, standard Python assert, to make sure that the result comes back is what we expected. So um, uh, that's uh, 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 basically what um, uh, uh, we've been doing. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I'm running out of time for in the, in the talk um, uh, length, so um, uh, 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 I just have to go briefly over these other things. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're also doing is um, implementing instructions. So we're doing um, our own um, uh, uh, advanced instructions, um, uh, adding those to draft uh, to the uh, to the power instruction set, um, because that's the um, the funding that we got from NL to do NL to do this. Um, and so the one I'm currently doing is a discrete cosine transform, um, uh, 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 which I start off from uh, the original uh, code. The best implementation I'll be able to find is uh, of uh, a recursive one of Project Naoki. I then turned that into um, uh, an iterative variant um, and then used uh, Python iterators to um, to express the triple loop uh, that uh, this is in um, uh, um, the, 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 um, the DCT um, is usually expressed recursively um, I had to create an iterative version that has three triple loops and then then um, I created some uh, Python generators which generate those um, so that we can use them in the simulator and in the HDL and check the things that are going on anyway um, uh, very, very briefly, um, if you'd like to help, we do actually have funding um, available um, of saying we're in several different areas. Um, this is our one serious computer science um, uh, project, uh, mostly, mostly written in Python, um, that uh, NLNet have very kindly um, uh, been supporting us in, in this uh, thing, in this endeavor. So uh, that's uh, Coriolis 2. Um, we have uh, the, a script for an uh, automated install of it, so you don't you don't have to go do the um, uh, the, the um, get, uh, mess about um, trying to work out how to how to get it up and done. It will create a Debian S cheroot um, in Debian 10 uh, for you. And um, again, that's the Chips of Chips for Makers website. If you um, if you want to do your own ASIC, he will help you, and he's also a Python programmer. 
Um, so um, saying, all right. So um, yeah, um, if you would like to help his procedure, so yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. Hello again. Uh, that is the end of the recorded portion of this talk session. Um, I would like to now invite Luke into the studio to answer any questions, though. Uh, as many of you in Element will have noticed, Luke has been prolific in answering questions in chat and providing extra resources and context to the talk that was just. And so. Thank you. That was really informative. A little bit over my head just because I haven't done any embedded programming of any kind in my life, but wow. <laughs> it, it's pretty heavy going. It's, it's, uh, you just have to be extraordinarily patient um, uh, with this level of detail. It's using Python to actually emulate and implement hardware. <laughs> Which is, uh, yeah. I, I have a question, and this is super basic, but mm. at least one other person who's attended this talk is in the same position. How do you get started with this? Uh, it helps that I was using my first computers age seven uh, in 1977. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been programming for 43 years. Um, and um, uh, I was messing about with um, circuit boards, PCBs, um, when I was like 12, um, uh, things like that, you know, soldering iron and all that sorts of stuff. So um, I, I kind of you know, got the, the background, but you just make the decision, this is what I'm going to do. And I, I had no idea what I was doing. And to be honest, I still don't. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> from the software engineering training engineering training the the, the rule of SD as an engineer was taught before you you start always know what the answer is going to be <laughs> have, that have way a good idea you can what write yourself a towards. look for what you're doing yeah um, and so that's what I've been doing and just very patiently um, drilling down fractal rabbit holes <laughs> in effect <laughs> um, uh, uh, one after the other just very very patiently and learning what's needed as a go along that makes a lot of sense um... Well, while we're waiting to see if anybody has a specific question in chat, I, I understand that this is like a rabbit hole in itself to ask about, but I have a, I have a security background. So like I, and like yeah, yeah. whenever I end up using a tool, I end up having to do quite a lot of research uh, into figuring out if it's secure or not. Package yeah. auditing is an entire nightmare. Um, are you running entirely Libre software and hardware? Yes, yes. Um, I've got a Versa ECP5 here, um, and uh, we also, um, one of our developers has a, a, a ULX3S. Um, the uh, ECP5 was reverse engineered, so the, uh, 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 the, the tool chain for that is nextpnr-ecp5, and um, uh, it's entirely Libre licensed. ECP5. Um, so we don't, when we're even doing the um, FPGA testing, um, uh, we don't have to um, use uh, install Xilinx uh, proprietary tools. Oh, right. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, makes I guess sense. I guess okay. ki kind of like your knowledge of of hardware and processors. I assume that um, this is the kind of thing that you've just sort of built up and accumulated over time. Because I don't even know where I would begin to shift to that kind of tool chain. <laughs> well, it, it's com it's combining as 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 a series of, of projects um uh, as of um, things you know um, but uh, it, it helps that i did um electronics um uh when i was when i was younger um and i've done you know, embedded design you know so i've missed about with arm boards i've done reverse engineering 
um, I, I did bring up of um, on XDA developers um, in 2003. I was um, uh, using uh, Haret or the GNU Haret uh, handheld reverse engineering tool um, to actually boot our own versions of Linux on Wint smartphones. And so um, the, the kinds of things that we need for, for bootstrapping up uh, the, the hardware, I, I know where I'm going. And it's, it's a sort of a roadmap. So it's, it's really strange. I, I just decided one day I was going to do this. Um, but it turns out that everything that I'd um, uh, done up to that point was relevant in uh, ex, uh, relevant training for this for this project. Um, it's quite um, quite fortuitous. No, it makes sense. Like it, it was, there was a lot of transferable knowledge. Uh, for for me, just from from my, from my level of experience and the kinds of things I've worked on, I have what I feel is like absolutely no transferable knowledge to get involved with this kind of work. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, later on, um, we'll actually have processes up and running um, uh, on FPGAs, you know, big FPGAs, um, where we will need people to to do, um, you know, security audits of saying, you know, actually running programs and seeing if it's uh, resistant to spectrum meltdown and blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but the nice thing is, by that point, you will actually be able to inspect the actual gate level running of the things and say this is a problem here and um uh, uh, highlighting it for us and somebody can come along and fix it oh yeah can that you makes imagine saying because, to, so doing yeah. that with intel no. <laughs> yeah it, no, it makes no sense. Chance. If, you, if you've controlled everything about this piece of hardware end to end you can audit it to a level of just like technical sophistication and depth right. that you wouldn't otherwise be able to with a commercial board for example yeah exactly and and the, the important thing about that is then that um did you hear that um uh supermicro got delisted from the nasdaq stock exchange for being unable to prove the provenance of their components i did actually read about that <laughs> yeah yeah if they'd used our process or used the techniques like it um, they would have been able to um to say no, knock yourselves out go and have a look at the go and have a look at the hdl and Huawei would have been able to take the U.S. government to court over the um, over the removal of things because they'd be able to say no, uh, no, Mr. Trump, um, you um, uh, uh, here's the um, under escrow license. You can actually inspect the the HDL, but you can't even do that with an Intel processor right now, or an AMD, or an ARM, um, or anything, because they license third party macros. Wow. They, Intel will license about 60 different pieces of HDL for subcomponents, where even if you, you, you had a customer come along with you know, several million dollars saying, here's a wad of cash, I want to look at the source code, they'd hit a wall of a thousand lawyers from third party IP. Right, and that, that impedes any further innovation in the space. Basically, yes. Wow. Yeah. So. Yeah, we're, so we're, we're, we're actually sort of smashing open a whole stack of doors of, 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 uh, of uh, what's it called, uh, apathy. Um, we're not just um, uh, doing, you know, um, using this in Python. We're actually um, uh, giving uh, free software developers the opportunity to contribute to something that's part of the future of computing. It's a fantastic project to be part of. Yeah. Absolutely, it's uh, it's it's pretty awesome. I'm I'm, I'm delighted. We've got like six hundred and fifty thousand euros in funding from NLNet and uh, from NGI Pointer. So if anybody wants to help out, they're more than welcome to to uh, to do so. Yeah, um, we we've essentially run out of time, and there will be a ten minute break. But um, I feel like you you've covered every possible question anybody could have possibly <laughs> come up with. Um, okay. So, uh, thank you for giving this talk. Um, is there, if people want to follow up, uh, there is a breakout room available that they continue to they they can continue to ask questions in if you're available to uh, answer anything else. Uh, but beyond that, um, it's because I feel like this is something people would want to do. Do you have a preferred way of? uh preferred medium for communication like can you be reached through twitter or email or something um, 
Um, we're, we're under audit conditions with uh, NLNet, so um, private conversations are fine, no problem. Um, but for technical discussions and et cetera, et cetera, we um, have to use uh, the IRC channel, which is logged um, and the uh, mailing list uh, uh, on list.libresoc.org. All the resources and everything available, you just go to uh, libresoc.org, or we're pretty high up on the um, uh, search engines uh, now. If you just type in libra-soc and you'll find us. All right. Um, thanks, Luke. Um, that was an incredible talk. Uh, I learned a lot. I feel like it's going to take a few months before it all settles in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, um, for everybody who is still currently in this room, we will now be taking a 10 minute break. I think we're at about the halfway mark for the conference. Um, following that break, you will have a new session chair in this room. The next talk will be the spec you never knew you needed. And it'll be the next session chair's responsibility to give the pits for all of those. So uh, thank you all for attending this talk. Uh, once again, Luke, thank you for delivering it. And I hope you have a good afternoon. Too.